again. I would like to continue our discussion, and I know it's always difficult after a short break to get everybody back on board, but we have now a very important discussion and debate on supporting labor market developments, how to maintain employability, boost productivity, and develop skills, especially in SMEs. We have the European Year of Skills not yet started, but uh, hopefully starting at least in May. And we have an opinion that we will have to adopt, and I do welcome uh, already uh, Mrs. Uh, Mincheva here at the, at the podium. We have two speakers who are remote, but we are very glad to have one speaker here with us in person. That's uh, Madame Panebarco, the Vice President of SME United and of Cena Nazionale from Italy. Uh, we have also Stefano Scarbetta, the Director of Employment, Labor and Social Affairs, and uh, Juan Antonio Pedreño, the President of Social Economy Europe, who will like Mr. Scapetta, participate remotely. So, uh, Mr. Scarpetta, all, all are connected, I guess. Thank you very much. Dear Director Scarpetta, dear Vice President uh, Panevarco, and dear President Pedereño, thank you very much for joining us for this debate. Our discussions today are very timely indeed. In the aftermath of the pandemic, the accelerated digitalization and greening and changing uh, work organization have shown the importance of upskilling and reskilling of workers so that we can maintain people's employability and productivity, especially in our aging society. Indeed, according to a CEDEFOP and Eurofound survey conducted in 2021, three in four surveyed companies experienced changing skills needs. CEDEFOP estimates that 128 million of Europeans are in need of upskilling and reskilling. This represents a pool of currently untapped potential. It is essential to equip them with adequate skills in order to keep up with the changing world of work. Let me say a few words about SMEs, which are the focus of the opinion that we will adopt right after this debate. They lead the European Union's economy and are key for the stability of our societies. If they are competitive on the global stage, the EU as a whole is competitive. Nowadays, SMEs struggle to cope with the current challenges and the impact of the war in Ukraine. They face higher prices for energy, transport and raw material shortages. They also lack qualified workers in many sectors and regions. This is not new, but the structural difficulties of SMEs in recruiting qualified staff are getting bigger, and it's mainly due to skills mismatches and gaps. This is, of course, where the quality initial education, reskilling and upskilling play a role. I am very pleased that the European Year of Skills will put a very much needed focus on skills. I would also add that social dialogue remains a key instrument for identifying needs and developing skills in workplaces. Social partners have a key, pro key role to play in the recognition of skills to maintain employability. A balance can be found between the willingness of employers, employees to strengthen their professional path and the company's needs for upskilled workers. Only a competitive Europe can create prosperity as well as sustainable solutions to climate and environmental problems. It is then vital to provide EU businesses with a favorable environment and skilled workers to be able to grow, innovate and be competitive on the global stage. Last but not least, it is also crucial to invest more in our youth and their skills for them to have a smoother transi transition into employment and entrepreneurship and fulfilling careers. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Scarbetta, the Director of the Employment, Labour and Social Affairs Directorate of the OECD. Uh, dear uh, Mr. Scarbetta, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'm very happy to participate uh, in this uh, session of the European Economic and uh, Social Committee. As you said, uh, Madam President, uh, um, skills have certainly become a critical component uh, to boost uh, labor market opportunities. 
but understanding uh, the skills that are needed uh, in our labor market, the one that are needed today and the one that will be needed tomorrow, remain uh, a major challenge. For example, the demand for high skill has been increasing over the past decade, but the different components of this demand have actually been changing very rapidly. Take, for example, the skill that will be needed for the green transition. Some recent studies finding that plant producing green goods and services employ, for example, a lower share of production worker. Uh, the studies show that the green jobs require relatively more engineering and technical skills and are therefore biased against the manual workers in favor of more technicians. Overall, the evidence points to a moderate skill bias effect of climate change and policies to promote a green transition, but technical skills certainly will be in high demand. The same, I think, apply when we think about the skill demand that is evolving because of the uh, digital technology. But I think this, in this area as well, the changes are very rapid indeed. With the advent of artificial intelligence, the picture is becoming more articulated and more nuanced, also concerning the demand for specific digital skills. In fact, in the past waves of automation strengthen in particular low-skilled workers. Our work showed that, for example, in the OECD countries and European countries as well, 27% of the low-educated workers were in jobs at high risk of automation in the next 10 years. And this was only 7% among the workers with tertiary level of qualifications. But the advent of artificial intelligence in this is changing the storyline. Tools such as the chat GPT show that AI can automate skills and abilities typically used by high skill jobs, such as reading comprehension, deductive and inductive reasoning skills. So the risk of automation for high skill occupation is also increasing. Overall, however, occupation at the high risk of full automation remain essentially low-skilled. This is because the high-skilled jobs also involve a number of skills and abilities that cannot be automated yet, even by the artificial intelligence, in particular creativity, complex problem solving, high-level management, and social interaction. High-skill occupation involves only about 5 to 10% of very highly automatable skills and abilities, but they involve 25% of skills and ability that we consider to be bottleneck for automation, including from artificial intelligence. The opposite is actually true when we look at low-skilled occupation. About 18 to 27% of skill and abilities required in these jobs are actually high automatable, and only about 5% of the skill and abilities in this occupation are bottleneck for automation. In practice, this means that reskilling and upskilling are crucial to help adults to adapt to the changing, very rapidly changing labor market requirement, but limited participation in training today is still a major obstacle. Only about 11% of adults in the EU27 participate in training over the four weeks period in 2021. This is only marginal improvement with the 8% that we observed in 2021. Even more worryingly, adults most at risk of losing out of the digital transition and the green transition are training the least. In the EU 27 countries, only 4% of adults without qualification train against 19% for those with the tertiary level of education. Looking at the age gap, the incidence of training is 22% for adults aged 25 to 34, but only 8% for all the workers. So there are a, certainly a skill dimension, but also an age dimension in the gap in access to training. Um, when we ask adults why they do not train, a 44% indicate lack of time, either because of family or work commitments. Another 12% say that the available training is not flexible enough in terms of where and when actually training takes place. Finally, 60% mentioned the lack of financial resources. Firms report similar type of barriers. So it's not just a question of finance, but it's actually a question of time and actually the adequacy of the training offer to actually meet the needs of companies and workers. To address these challenges, government and employers alike are taking steps to make training more accessible and actually better adapted to the needs of the labor market. In particular, many countries are responding to these challenges, making training more flexible. 
shorter courses, for example, that are certified and can be stuck to achieve a qualification down the line are preferable for adults in general and even more so for the low skilled who can least afford to take time off work uh, for a productive period of time or to pay for childcare where they are in training. Online provision of different types of training, including modular ones and short online courses, offer more varied training opportunities, particularly for job seekers in remote areas. The good news is that countries have invested a lot on online training provision during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we can actually take stock of the progress we have made during this period. Many countries are all making provision to more modular, in some cases using micro-credential, spurred by the European Commission recommendation micro-credential that was issued last year. The Nordic countries have a long experience in this respect, but other countries are also moving in the same direction. Let me mention a few examples. In Spain, is introducing modularity in its adult learning system, offering micro-credentials and recognition of prior learning. In Denmark, all participants to the vocational education and adults participate in a prior learning assess assessment that places them in one of the three tracks, allowing them for shorter training period. The second policy priority, in my view, is making sure that training opportunities are well aligned with the actual needs in the current and in the future labor markets. Skill shortages are costly for both the firms and for the workers alike. Skill mismatch are associated with increasing risk of unemployment, lower wages, and poor career prospect for the workers. To help to effective reallocation of jobs, but also to reduce the widespread skill imbalances we are seeing in Europe, it is important to produce a detailed assessment of future skill needs that feed this information into education as well as training and employment policies. The third and final priority in my view is improving the assessment of existing skill gaps and training needs and in many cases, they offer incentive to encourage workers and company to actually fully exploit the training opportunities. In particular, small and medium-sized enterprise continues to face difficulties in this area. In many cases, management skills tend to be low, and we know that these are crucial for driving investment also in training. Many countries have been using voucher systems to support manager training with the ultimate aim of promoting investment in training and technology adoption. SMEs also uh, come together to form networks, uh, often with specific, in specific sectors, in order to share the costs and actually designing together training opportunities. Employee involvement in training design and provision of job seekers can also boost the employment effect of such programs. A recent OECD evaluation of training programs in Lithuania, for example, shows that job seekers who benefited from training through a tripartite agreement with the public employment service and employers saw much higher and long-lasting employment effect than other job seekers who attended somewhat regular training programs. So, to stimulate for action by employers is therefore crucial that promote training as an investment and actually to make sure that training offer is adequate to the need of the companies, including SMEs, but also, of course, to the need of the workers. All in all, I think, as you said, Madam President, at the beginning, it is very urgent in Europe to invest more, but also better in skills. And to do that, I think financial resources are certainly an important component, but actually better design of training courses to, that meet the demand for companies, that meet the demand for workers, and work it together, government at all levels, together with employers and workers seems to be the way to go. So these are some of the remarks I would like to share with you. Again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to intervene in this session of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Scarpetta. I hope you stay with us online because we'll invite you afterwards also to react to the remarks of our colleagues. But now I, have, I turn to my right and I have the pleasure of welcoming <coughs> Madame Pane Barco, the Vice President of SME United and Cena Nazionale. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Dear President of the European Economic and Social Committee, dear honorable members, good afternoon to you all. Many thanks for this invitation to take part into this uh, topical debate. Before I share with you my reflections, I would like to introduce myself. 
I'm an entrepreneur in the audiovisual sector, I do cartoons, but I'm also national vice president of CNA, delegate to European policies, and vice president of SME United. CNA is an Italian association representing SMEs, crafts, and also professionals, together with other 70 similar organizations from 30 European countries, we are members of SME United. Thus, I'm here today to bring the voice of my fellow entrepreneurs and to give you an insight on a structural crisis that we are all facing, the lack of skilled workforce. My statement today is based on a key concept. Enterprises are made of persons, both employers and employees, and persons can be the most powerful booster of productivity. The current labour market situation has a strong impact on SMEs, which face huge difficulties in recruiting qualified staff and, as a consequence, are hampered in their growth potential. This lack of qualified sta uh, staff is due to a combination of factors. First, our demographics the aging of the population. Secondly, the lack of adaptation to rapid labor market changes. We anticipate insufficiently new skill needs for the digital and green transition and additionally adapt education curricula inadequately to new labor market needs. Finally, we notice a reduced mobility in the European Union. In terms of skills needed by SMEs for their growth and competitiveness, we see three main areas of action as SME United. Our entrepreneurs notice an increasing lack of robust basic skills. That means that some even indicate that youngsters have difficulties reading, writing and counting. Moreover, SMEs ask candidates to have the necessary transversal soft skills, such as creativity, adaptability, co-creation, which are fundamental for embracing and implementing change processes. Finally, entrepreneurs would be happy if candidates possess technical skills for twin transition, basic digital green skills, and more advanced technical skills, depending on the sector. However, they are willing to train new staff as well if they commit to stay with a company for a certain time. This is a big issue for us. The main challenges that SMES face in providing training are, first, the cost of training, the lack of an adequate training offer, and lack of necessary resources and support to design a professional tailor-made development and training plan. Secondly, the lack of time and motivation on the side of SME employees. Third, the need for a strategy with return on investment for both sides. Therefore, it's necessary to set up support programs, including financial support for SMEs, enabling them to put in place concrete measures to attract and manage talents effectively. At national, regional levels, social partners, business organizations, chambers of crafts and training centers have an important role to play, such as design adequate solutions for continuing training. At European level, SME United fully plays its role as social partner. We do so by echoing the needs of SMEs to European policymakers to ensure that the initiatives are more in line with SME needs. We need to have a societal change toward the culture of lifelong learning. This is key to enhance employability and to build a stronger resilience towards the fast change in labour market. In SME United, we have been investing a lot of time in a skilled topic since many years. In 2022, the European Year of Youth, we called our annual theme Youth and Skilled Workforce to promote apprenticeship, VET and entrepreneurship education from an early age. In 2023, European Year of Skills, we will work on skills development, development in SMEs. SME United presented six main priorities that should be tackled in the years to come to solve the labour and skills shortages. First priority is to ensure good orientation services for young people and adults. Orientation is the key for a successful career. Secondly, we want to build a closer 
partnership between the education and training world and labor market actors, especially SMEs. As an example, in partnership with academic bodies, with our SME Academy Avignon, we have developed an EU pilot project for an online platform called SME Craft VetNet, available in different languages. The project is supported by Erasmus+. Plus. Thirdly, we continue calling for an improved image of vocational education and training, including higher vet and apprenticeship. Unfortunately, they are still not the first choice for young people. Moreover, each SME should be aware that when a young person starts an experience in their enterprise, it's essential to create a positive environment in order to make him or her feeling part of the company from the very beginning. Training programs for entrepreneurs and employees should include this aspect too. As a fourth point, we ask to improve skills intelligence tools for better identifying skills needs in the various sectors. Forecasting is more than ever required to anticipate and identify the new skills needs and support governance structures at national level to adopt the most appropriate policies. Our first Fifth priority is to invest in upskilling and reskilling and foster lifelong learning. We see now which cost the lack of training entails for our society in terms of employability and staff retention. SME United recommends to increase the training of entrepreneurs and workers alike by improving information, guidance and counselling. Finally, we must enhance a faster recognition of qualification and skills through specific assessment tools for third country nationals. This is really important. Economic migration is an opportunity to fill the labor shortages in our SMEs. We are active in a multi-stakeholder, as SME United, we are active in a multi-stakeholder approach of labor market integration at EU and national level. In the frame of our annual theme, we are currently collecting practices from our members for these priorities that I enlisted, and we will put forward a number of recommendations, in particular on how to support SMEs to provide more and better training by the end of the year, and we will be happy to share them with you. I look forward to contribution uh, of my colleagues here, and I really thank you for this. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Pane Barco. Now, again, an online speaker, uh, Senor Pedreño. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, gracias, Presidenta. Desde Social Economy Europe, la entidad representativa de la economía social europea, fue una entidad, una asociación, una organización formada por when an association made up of 2.8 uh, in firms, 13.6 million employees in the social economy, accounting for 6.3% of the working population in the European Union. And on their behalf, I'd like to start by complimenting the European Economic and Social Committee and um, Maria Mincheva, the, re the rapporteur, for this splendid uh, uh, opinion being presented to the European Year of Competition. This provides some guidance and impetus towards adequate investment, with ongoing training for European workers, members. We've seen great and we want to tackle the socio-economic crisis in the most inclusive way possibly can. The social economy has a long history of inclusion in the labour market and it's a vital element in ensuring a fair green transition. We've been doing so by developing professional skills and enabling people accessing the labour market doing everything possible to address socio-economic challenges and develop completely new markets, the so-called emerging sectors. In this wide range of activities, the social economy is a vital element in equipping the European Union with capacity for the future. The social economy can continue to create quality jobs, but in pursuit of that, 
we must make sure we have the the workforce we need that will allow us to be competitive. Proximity is local economies are one of the fourteen vectors of Europe. So economy we need to work on this if we're to have a fair green transition involving the whole population. In as far as socio economy Europe is concerned, we're fully committed to these challenges. The agenda set out in the opinion and increasing skills are one of the goals of our association. Together with the Commission, we're leading the European Competition Alliance within the industrial, local, social economy network. SMEs and uh, larger organizations such as the Mondragon Cooperative Organization, representative of the social economy, universities, vocational training centers, research centers, and cities such as uh, Antwerp, Bologna, Torres Vedras, and, and all the Navarre region are all involved. We're working on shared goals to develop collective intelligence on training for the future so that we can respond to the needs of the green and digital transitions. There has to be participation in governance, impact st studies. We need to get young people involved in developing the economy, as the President said earlier on. In Social Economy Europe, together with Mondragon University, we are working on a central plan very focused on the, the green transition in the social economy. Above and beyond what we're doing, I want to point out that we're on the leading edge in the green transition. Uh, unfortunately, the sound quality is, is not adequate for the interpreters to continue. Uh, I'm sorry. Organizaciones comprometidas con la mejora de la infraestructura ciclista, la agricultura biológica de proximidad a la distribución o la inversión en la transición verde por parte de las entidades financieras de la economía social, como son los bancos éticos y los bancos cooperativos. Y si nos referimos al ámbito de la transición digital, competencia necesaria para mantener la empleabilidad, es relevante tener en cuenta el marco europeo de las competencias. Y dentro de esta dentro de este marco, las cinco áreas de la competencia digital, información, comunicación, colaboración, creación de contenido y resolución de problemas. La capacitación digital de los trabajadores de una empresa o entidad ha de ser uno de los elementos clave en cualquier propuesta de estrategia digital. Debe planificarse no solamente desde la perspectiva de contenidos de formación, sino desde un enfoque integral que nos permita vislumbrar las necesidades a medio o corto plazo de nuestra estrategia digital. Las empresas y entidades de la economía social deben permanecer alertas a la importancia en general, todas las empresas, alerta a la importancia de la organización digitalmente competente, que incluyen líderes conscientes de las necesidades de los procesos de digitalización, junto con estrategias útiles para promover la colaboración y la capacitación de todos los trabajadores de las empresas. O entidad importante, es, es importante invertir en infraestructuras tecnológicas, pues serán la base de la transformación digital, pero la dotación tecnológica por sí sola no va a ser la garantía del éxito en los procesos de digitalización. Una estrategia digital empresarial exitosa ha de contemplar todas las dimensiones organizativas, y ha de valorar los tiempos y las inversiones necesarias, tanto desde el punto de vista de los recursos materiales como de recursos humanos y formación, unidos a las estrategias de liderazgo y colaboración. En base a uno de los objetivos del Petreño. Dear Mr. Peterino, I'm very sorry, but the connection is very weak. We have an issue with the interpretation. Can I kindly ask you to talk a little bit slower so it might be easier for our interpreters okay. to follow? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. En base a uno de los objetivos del, del dictamen, que es hacer propuestas para mantener... Unfortunately, the issue was not so much with the speaker's speed as with the quality of the sound. Okay los nuevos perfiles profesionales y también explora las profesiones que irán desapareciendo 
Todo lo que desaparece implica invertir en formación de calidad y adecuada para estos sectores de cambio. El 50% de los empleados, uno de cada dos, van a tener que recualificarse en los próximos cinco años. Y el 40% va a haber... I'm cómo sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you once more. The German translation is able to translate. So maybe I invite the, uh, the interpreters to really switch to the German channel because apparently they can do the translation and then you can do it from German. Thank you very much. Mr. Pedreño, I'm so sorry. Please continue. Thank you. Bien, pues se señalaba que en base a uno de los objetivos del dictamen, que es hacer propuestas para mantener la empleabilidad, es uno de los objetivos, el título, uno de los títulos del dictamen, y según el informe del futuro del trabajo del World Economic Forum, que rige los nuevos perfiles profesionales y también explora las profesiones que irán desapareciendo, todo lo que desaparece implica invertir necesariamente en formación de calidad y adecuada para estos cambios. El 50% de los empleados, uno de cada dos, van a tener que recualificarse en los próximos cinco años. Y el 40% va a ver cómo sus competencias clave cambian en estos próximos años. Desde la economía social, creadora de empleo estable y de calidad, dedicada además a proporcionar las habilidades adecuadas a jóvenes y mujeres, habilidades que, que entendemos, que consideramos que son responsabilidad de las administraciones, facilitarlas, facilitar los recursos necesarios para dotar de las competencias necesarias a las personas trabajadoras para que no pierdan su empleo, para que mantengan su empleabilidad, pero también a las personas desempleadas para facilitar su acceso al mercado laboral. Eh, y lo hacemos desde un modelo empresarial con cultura democrática y participativa y con unos valores y principios que sintonizan con los de una nueva generación que está en condiciones de dar respuesta a los principales retos actuales, entre ellos el cambio climático o la desigualdad. Europa necesita, además, talento joven capaz de entender la complejidad del, mer del mercado y de la sociedad. Creo que la economía I'm sorry social... Again. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Could you talk a little bit closer to the mic? I'm so sorry for this. And a bit slower, because otherwise, really, the interpreters have an issue, and it would be a pity to lose you. Thank you, Mr. Pedreño. Bien. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Finalizo, finalizo señalando que Europa necesita talento joven capaz de entender la complejidad del mercado y de la sociedad. Creo que la economía social y su modelo de gestión, basado en la prioridad de la persona, como bien marca el Plan de Acción Europeo para la Economía Social recientemente aprobado por la Comisión Europea, construir una economía que funcione para las personas, son un ejemplo para el resto de Europa. Sin duda, este dictamen, que propone ideas y propuestas sobre cómo mantener la empleabilidad, cómo aumentar la productividad y cómo desarrollar las capacidades, va a ser, sin duda, un elemento fundamental para ello. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, and uh, I'm sorry for the connection problems. Uh, now over to María Mincheva, she to present her opinion. María. Thank you very much. I want to underline that when we started this uh, own initiative opinion, when we planned the topic, we had no idea that 2023 will be announced as the European Year of Skills. So delivering this today uh, under the, the context of the European of Skills is really uh, a joy to me. We all know that the European labour market is, is transforming and we face new challenges. This is not new. The acceleration of technological progress coupled with the climate change, the demographic change, uh, the, the ageing society, the issues of migration, and now for the few years, uh, digital and green transitions. We have changing nature of work, especially after COVID, uh, and at the same time we have a growing role of the human potential and uh, labour productivity. And exactly this transformation requires a good understanding of what type of skills are needed for the future of uh, labor market transformations if you want to maintain sustainable employability, a high level of uh, productivity, and uh, to reduce uh, labor sh shortages. 
Skills are, of course, central to the abilities of societies, companies and individuals to thrive uh, in an increasingly interconnected and fast-changing world. Skills development and effective access to lifelong learning, as it was mentioned by all the speakers uh, before me, should be an integral part of uh, broader economic uh, growth strategies and recovery and resilience plans. And, of course, SMEs need special attention in this, in this respect. They should be encouraged to work in networks that interact, to cooperate in sharing costs for research, for skills needs, as this was mentioned, that it already exists in a number of countries, but these good examples need to be further spread. The future of work will be different for people with the different levels of education and qualification. The capacity to constantly update digital skills will undoubtedly be amongst the most important challenges in the future. If we want the green transition to be successful, we require people with the right skills and workplaces with the right working conditions and production systems. And we believe that social partners have a key role in ensuring this just transition in a, in a number of economic sectors. Having said that, of course, digital skills, STEM skills, and a higher order cognitive skills will undoubtedly uh, be among the most important skills in the future. Meta skills, uh, which accelerate the acquisition of other skills and are a catalyst for faster learning and successful life, uh, lifelong development, are key to maintaining employability in the modern conditions. We believe that sustainable employability is a multifaceted issue, and we believe that social partners are key actors uh, when it comes to developing, of, uh, maintaining, and uh, uh, the employability skills. We also point out in our uh, opinion a few ideas on how uh, the labor force could be developed for an inclusive labor market and higher productivity, because this is uh, crucial to us in the study group. Uh, these ideas, they are linked to well-functioning employment system, optimizing monitoring and forca forecasting skills needs in the labor market, uh, making accessible analytical data on skills uh, to provide training and qualification relevant to the labor market needs, analyzing the barriers faced by young people uh, to acquiring STEM qualifications and skills, creating agile, resilient, and future-proof VET systems, which can attract young people and support their entry into a changing labor market. And, of course, ensure the, a more strategic active role for the social partners in accelerating the, the cycle of the creation and offering new qualification, the updating of the curricula and uh, funding mechanisms and quality, quality audits. I, I stop here as my time finished, but uh, I am fully aligned with uh, what the speakers ahead of me shared on the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we proceed to the general debate with the SC members, and the first speaker on my list is Monsieur Potier. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. With the uh, Marine, uh, I'm behind uh, uh, taking this initiative uh, with the SME's uh, assistance, and I'd like to thank her for the excellent uh, cooperation I enjoyed. But in what I was saying about the situation in the SMEs earlier on, I think that all European enterprises, uh, uh, SMEs represent uh, uh, about 90% uh, uh, of uh, the uh, industrial fabric, uh, and they need a special attention special care because of the technicity of uh, their professional uh, profiles uh, uh, and their unique uh, savoir-faire and in their niche market strengths. The labor market uh, and uh, alternating uh, systems uh, could be adapted uh, to uh, adapting uh, to seasonal work. And I think to encourage uh, uh, the labor market to, to grow, I think that uh, the national uh, markets uh, should allow uh, uh, all stakeholders uh, to be involved. Let us recall that social partners have a major role to play in the uh, professional uh, social dialogue. Uh, social partners also have responsibilities in defining uh, professional certification requirements uh, and constantly monitor the need for change. And finally, to facilitate uh, young people's participating in, on the labor market, we need uh, career guidance uh, to be strengthened uh, so that uh, we can 
look at uh, the motivations uh, for their future activity and putting them in a good working condition and particularly to follow uh, these young people's careers throughout their lives. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to focus on three points within the opinion that we've agreed on and worked on together. The first point is productivity and competitiveness. They don't depend just on skills, but a whole range of factors, including the ability to plan for the necessary investment over the medium to longer term, not just nationwide development, but locally too. You need to invest in the right place at the right time. Don't just pluck it out of a basket. You need a, a proper uh, analysis, and proper planning. Obviously, collective bargaining is vital. We have a, a, a lot of collective agreements that offer innovative training and innovative means of, of funding training, which must be made a right. As Mr. Scarpetta said, I, I couldn't agree more with, with everything he said. A lot's been said on SMEs. We have a, a great wealth of experience in uh, in Italy with networks of SMEs in industry. Linking up with you, we, we can encourage them to structure themselves in a way where costs can be shared when you train people. Coming now to young people, I quite agree. We talk about uh, the skills mismatch, a lot's been said about that. But I'd like to focus on well-qualified young people who move to other industrialised countries because they find better pay there and better career opportunities. You can't pay 600 euros to a, a, a scientific research in Italy. There's a, there is a, a, a question of a decent remuneration for these young people. And there's also the cost to the, the, the state it spends money on training young people, but then off they go to other countries. So what we need are resources from the EU and the member states to provide incentives in agreements with uh, universities, other <coughs> specialist centres and business so that there are stable, high quality uh, jobs for highly skilled young people to keep them in their home countries. So let's use um, the European resources in a structured way. Thank you, dear President, and I would like to thank our guests also coming today for this very important topic uh, to discuss employability, productivity, and also skills that are really essential at the moment. I would like to also um, mention and, and thank Mr. Scarpetta, uh, Ms. Panabarco, and Mr. Uh, Padreño mentioning the lack of skilled workforce. I'm representing the section that is responsible for transport, energy, infrastructure, information society. And of course, uh, these are the core uh, issues. The EU intention to reduce carbon emissions in order to follow a credible pathway towards net zero emissions by 2050 requires significant investments on capacity, skills and knowledge for low carbon electricity generation, but also other energy and non-energy applications in the coming years and decades. A structured and efficient plan for the development of critical skills and competences are essential to make the European Union energy transition successful. We need to respond to a rapid shift towards a climate and not neutral Europe within, um, within this year that is dedicated to year of skills. And therefore, let me list some most prominent uh, issues that are important. So we need to promote increased and more efficient inclusive investments in training and upskilling to harness the full potential of the European workforce and to support people in changing from one job to another. Making sure that skills are relevant for labour market needs by also cooperating with social partners and companies matching people's aspirations and skill set with opportunities on the job market, especially for the green and digital transition and the economic recovery, and increased focus 
should be given to activate more people for the labor market, in particularly women and young people, especially those not in education, employment or training. Also attracting people from third countries with the skills needed by the EU, including by strengthening learning opportunities and mobility and facilitating the recognition of qualifications. I would like to really uh, congratulate uh, Rapporteur uh, Maria Mincheva for the, for the great work she did and I would like to uh, also encourage members to vote for their opinion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Baiba. Uh, Paul Rubik, bitte. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. We know that uh, this area, employment, plays a central role in our social Europe. We have over 25 million SMEs, and these SMEs work day by day to ensure prosperity in Europe and to stop poverty. We know that SMEs represent 80% of tax payments and uh, have a significant role in terms of employment. So we need to ensure that SMEs do have access to platforms which uh, facilitate employment, uh, training. We need to look at the whole picture. New technologies are required here. We need platform technologies in such a way that we can uh, close the gap in terms of access to ongoing training. We need to put this at the centre of our action. Commissioner Maria Gabriel talked about uh, talent initiatives. A million new workers will be receiving qualifications over the next three years. This is a huge piece of work. The European Institute for Technology is involved and contributing. I also think it's important uh, to think about these platforms in Europe. We need to provide greater support to platform technologies. Smart Bio is a new platform which really is uh, having a huge impact at the European level and I think it would be a good idea for us to get involved and to think about how we can support SMEs and encourage them to get involved and to think about this in terms of their human uh, resources policies. This is for employers, workers and consumers. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Mr. Dundee. Thank you, Madam President. Um, first, I would like to congratulate Maria Mincheva for the good idea to come with this own initiative opinion. Indeed, employability, it is a very important factor that we should take care of during these two big revolutions that will create effects on the labor market, greening and digitalization. But it is also important to keep an eye open on employability because as far as we know, all or almost all OECD countries are passing by a declining demographic trend. So keeping employability at the highest possible level will help us to keep the employment rate for the next decades at a level that will allow our economies and our social security systems to work properly. Indeed, uh, keeping employability at a high level, it is directly linked to the power and resources that our vocational systems, training vocational system has, but also as Madam Panembarko explained, we seen millions of employees at the level of the European market not having access to specific training for increasing their skills or keeping at the same level their qualifications, because usually the small and medium-sized enterprises do not lack the resources necessary for 
organizing training programs. That's why I really share the idea that we have in this opinion, recommending to small and medium-sized enterprises to share resources in order to increase the quality of vocational training systems that are fundamental for a good employability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Garini. Grazie, grazie, Presidente. Un dibattito davvero molto... Thank you, Madam President. This is a very interesting debate. I'd like to thank uh, our guests who took the floor and hats off to the rapporteur for this very interesting opinion. I agree with virtually everything that's been said, everything I've heard this afternoon from colleagues and guests. So just allow me to um, change the focus very slightly on a couple of points. One was picked up on by Ms. Panemarco and the other by Mr. Dandea. The, the, the question of uh, the birth rate and population trends, anything to do with economic development and employment in Europe must take due stock just as forcefully as we embrace the green transition and the digital transition. The demographic imbalances that we face. I know this is a very awkward issue and we're not at all keen to discuss um, the issue of, of immigration in conjunction with this but we have to. The second topic I wanted to do, touch on was inequality. We all agree that we need training, we need to enhance people's skills but there's also an issue revolving around the fact that employment is a resource which is unfairly distributed. Some people work too much and others don't have enough work. And amongst those who are overworking, in many instances it's because they have to take on a, a, a number of uh, uneven jobs to make ends meet. So we need to spread op op job opportunities and the quality of the jobs we offer. But it's not quite as a uh, group two colleagues have said. How do you reorganize value chains? Many small firms and um, people in the craft industry say they've no time to train people because they're overcome by work and the inequalities in the value chain distribution. Now, of course, we do have to put a huge investment into training, but at the same time, we need to to recognize the importance of the social economy pillar. The, the liberal market can't solve all the problems on its own. We need a patient economy, a, a economy that has a, a local footing, the social economy mentioned by Mr. Pedrinho, and we need to change our model. because um, there's everything we need, but it's not fairly distributed. So when talking about skills, we also need to look at the level of resources we make available to the whole system and all the ecosystems within the European model, which is made up largely of small firms that need support, but we also need to think through a different economic uh, development model for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Violeta Jelic. Thank you. I will speak Croatian. I would like to congratulate our colleague Maria. She timely made this opinion and I could repeat whatever our colleagues have told that um, said that uh, what are the problems are. This is simply our everyday life and the problems that we encounter are at a daily basis. We have to recognize what are important skills so that we can train everyone. The capacities for training, uh, we need uh, people who are qualified to train others. We need people who will 
give things and networking is extremely important in that matter uh, micro um, uh, uh, SMEs are really important in that matter but uh, what is very important are the chambers of commerce because they can offer the um, lifelong training thank you Thank you very much, Mrs. Barrera Chamorro. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Ms. Mincheva for the fantastic idea of putting this opinion together. I'd like to say, as has been said, uh, that uh, the crises we been facing the healthcare crisis, the energy crisis, all these crises are a real challenge in terms of employability. And because of all that, we need to ensure access to qualifications, digital, ecological qualifications. This is a right for all adult people, for all workers. This should be based on uh, certified quality training. We need to see a reduction uh, in the digital gap which grew throughout the pandemic because uh, this means that we're seeing a growth in low paid jobs and uh, this is impacting the middle class. This also has an impact on our level of well-being and puts that at risk. We need to nip this trend in the bud in terms of the digital transition. This is impacting our social model. We need to look at training and uh, education. This can shouldn't just be a question for workers. It should be a responsibility for society as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to thank the rapporteur uh, for the comment made uh, and for the work done. Seen from my dad's point of view, who worked for 45 years, uh, uh, and uh, he uh, left it uh, only after that. Uh, and of course, uh, my grandchildren are also going to be out on the labor market soon, and they're not going uh, to uh, be employed for 45 years. I think uh, there's a need to perhaps uh, to share out the work. Uh, what we need is a good basic education because uh, as uh, societies changes a change, we need to be able to adapt, but we also need education for everyone, and that is crucial. The trade union organizations uh, 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 have uh, been able to get together to uh, uh, get a new collective uh, bargaining agreement because each wage earner has a guarantee that during the course of their professional life they can upskill, but they need to be able to be paid 80% of their pay level. And it is both sides of industry on the labor market. Uh, the state's task should just be to provide for guidance, uh, but it is actually the two sides of industry that need to chart out uh, the way forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Macchio. Cara Presidente, cari colleghi. Thank you, President. Colleagues. I must add my voice to the course of those, in particular Mr. Guarini, who made the point that um, life expectancy and birth rates require us to take a fresh look at the way we organise work. We need to, to look at new types of, of sexual training, particularly for the, the service economy. We need to restructure the economy of, of cities to, to enhance accessibility and help ensure that older people can be autonomous. When we've addressed those problems, we will also have solved problems for people with disabilities and uh, families with children too. Obviously, the digital transition is of increasingly strategic importance for the sector too. So taking that with proper infrastructures, it, it, it's too... Experts have said new activities come to being. We, we must be ready and encourage the development of these new activities as they emerge. Thank you very much. Uh, Tatiana Babros. Thank you. And thank you, Maria, for this initiative to focus on skills. You know, skills uh, is my passion. And uh, 
I'm exciting, excited to look at this uh, year of skills, what it can bring, and I really hope that there will be citizens in the center. This year is also coinciding with uh, uh, the year uh, before the parliament elections. And being in this house, I really hope that, that the politicians will not use uh, this year as the platform just to deliver nice speeches. We have enough of speeches. We have enough of our skills agendas, uh, skills uh, strategies, a uh, lot of recommendations, and, and a, lot of, a lot of initiatives. What we really need, we need to uh, deliver, and we are failing. And this, this, uh, we have so many disadvantaged regions. Someone mentioned, but I think this is the key issue we have to focus on during the skill year and bring the results. If we are not bringing the results, then uh, nobody will believe the year of skills was existed, existing. Thank you very much. Monsieur Schwab. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam President. Stefano Scavetta's opinion also mentions a a system of vocational training which would allow us to provide the skills the business community needs. In France, uh, training systems for, for start-ups ensure that all business leaders will have the basic skills they, they need to set up a, a craft industry in terms of um, law, lab, you know, labour law, accountancy and so forth. It, it was uh, abolished in 2019. That's very regrettable. The European Union should provide support for such measures. New models of, of work and revisiting of, of um, collective bargaining need to be dealt with cautiously. Initially, we, we need to drive down unemployment, but there's a risk of making working conditions more precarious. And we, we shouldn't lower the skill requirements. The guidelines on the enforcement of European competition rules in collective bargaining has a bearing on um, self-employed workers. The vagueness there creates um, a distortion of competition with, with local firms who, that have managed to create jobs. Thank you for the opinion. Thank you, Madam President. I shall speak to more in Maltese. Lower in First of all, I would like to start by saying that I agree with the contents of the opinion. I would like to add that in the context of uh, SMEs, uh, an element that is important uh, for the employer and the employees is what is called innovation on the workplace, in workplace innovation. Uh, according to research that I have carried out in my country, this innovation helps productivity as long as there is uh, full participation and active participation with the workers. And this leads to positive results uh, and uh, it helps um, an increase in productivity. It leads also to better conditions for workers. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much, Ms. Lugetti. Thank you, Chairman. 2023 is the European Year of uh, Skills. And amongst the, the important uh, things that we're discussing, digital skills uh, in advanced technologies uh, and uh, meta skills. The labor market in Europe uh, is going through profound changes, partly uh, because of demographic uh, trends, making it necessary to promote uh, modern forms of organization, innovating with new timetables and flexible work hours in order to reconcile uh, professional and family lives. Uh, against such a backdrop, where the technological revolution is having a serious impact on the labor market, uh, we need to be able uh, uh, to skillfully manage the opportunities uh, that these uh, systems uh, to develop our skills uh, can become more effective. And of course, there's a strong link uh, with the ability to improve uh, skills levels and the qualifications of workers uh, and the social uh, partners, of course, uh, have to join their forces uh, to improve and uh, shore up uh, these initiatives uh, uh, and also to meet with the new needs of the business world uh, and uh, to uh, update uh, the collective uh, skill level so that we can meet future challenges. Uh, we need to be more and more inclusive uh, and to guarantee equal opportunities uh, with active uh, training programs uh, for reskilling. 
Thank you very much. Now I do invite uh, Maria Mincheva to give us her reply to all the remarks she has heard. One minute, please, Maria. Thank you. To be able to, to manage in one, in one minute, I will say a few words uh, that I said already in, in, in my presentation that sustainable employability is a multi multifaceted issue. And we do believe that when governments work on economic strategies, skills must be there. Otherwise, we have resources that are spent somewhere. The outcome is not satisfactory. And we are where we are, talking and talking and no, no delivery. Uh, we have a certain context. This is very, something very important. Demography was mentioned a few times. We stress the need to implement effective active aging policies. We need to have the good focus on the, the SMEs and the structure of the economy. So if we plan to change the structure of the economy and have successful transitions, we need the people with the right skills. So we need synergies. And as Tatiana said, I do hope that this year will be taken as a good instrument to, to start working in a more effective manner. And thank you for the kind words of, of, of the people. And I'm happy to see that there is such a broad consent on the challenges and the possible solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Now I do invite uh, first uh, Mr. Scarbetta and then um, Madame Panebarco to give their replies. But uh, I do have to apologize, uh, Senor Pedreño, who needs to catch a flight. So Mr. Scarbetta, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Let me say again a big thanks to the European Economic and Social Committee for sharing with us this opinion. Also from the discussion we had today, you wouldn't be surprised if I say that we fully align with the main policy elements that are included in this opinion. I'm conscious of time, so let me be quite telegraphic on some of the observations I'd like to share with you at this point. I think we fully agreed uh, with the assessment that digital and green transition, as well as the population aging, are creating many new employment opportunities, but also causing substantial changes in the labor market. And in this context, training and retraining become more than ever important. Uh, the labor market impact of the green transition and the digital transformation are highly uneven. They create many job opportunities for those with the right skill, but also challenges many of the jobs with the more traditional forms of skills. It is crucial to invest in connecting people to jobs through expanded, not only training and retraining opportunities, but also active labor market policies. It is essential, in my view, to invest in formal education, but also on lifelong learning. Lifelong learning that applies to all workers and actually involves all companies. Training should be designed to be accessible and attractive also to all the workers and those with low level of skills. These are the group of workers that are more exposed to the risk of automation. This was stressed by many of those who have intervened in this session. We fully agree that anticipating skill need is essential. And we need actually granular level of information that allow to understand what are the needs for large companies as well as for small and medium-sized enterprises that oftentimes have more difficulties in actually accessing effective training opportunities. And let me conclude, it is essential to invest government at the national and local level, but actually the social partner. This major agenda we have in front of us in building, using, adapting skills is an agenda that should involve the government, but without a strong involvement of social partners, I'm not sure we can achieve the objective we have in front of us. Thank you again for inviting me to this important session. Thank you very much for your reply. And now over to Madame Panebarko. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, many thanks to Mrs. Maria Minceva for the great draft opinion. Very well done. And thanks to all the other members, uh, because I heard very well this reflection that, and we agree upon many aspects. Uh, I would seize the opportunity of this more further time just to make two general remarks on the opinion that we would like to share with you. One, it's in order to capture the skills needs of SME 
SMEs, it's key to continue working on good skills forecasting tools. We need to be more precise in identifying the skills at regional and sectoral level as labor market intelligence and observatories are more reliable at these levels due to their close connections with the local ecosystem and labor market specificities. And we also ask you to support a more systematic data exchange on craft skills and professional, because here it's important to encourage the exchange among private and also public data research centers all around Europe. The second general is uh, about capacity building of social partners and SME organization at national level, because they are the best place to support entrepreneurs and SMEs to anticipate and navigate change in the labor markets, and they can support them to identify the needs of these sectors and accompany them with appropriate information, and in some cases also training. And then, just to conclude, some two specific and detailed remarks. One is on point 112. Uh, it's a great point, but we should also involve chambers of commerce and association at local and regional level in order to create networks and shared learning programs. And the cost of training should be shared among all the actors, including trade unions and employees. And the very, very last one is about point 0.31. Uh, for us, it's essential to guarantee the survival of these activities, that they are unique and have a high social value. And moreover, I, I'm speaking about crafts uh, and crafts activities, and moreover, cannot be replaced by machine. Here, the challenge is to make them more attractive for young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for this fruitful exchange and for the inspiring contributions. I do look forward to further collaboration with our guests' respective organizations, in particular during the European Year of Skills. And this year presents the right opportunity to implement the skills guarantee, offering the right to access quality and inclusive training for all, to enable full participation in society and to manage transitions in the labour market. And this year should aim at achieving the best possible progress in all fields of education and training, starting from elementary up to initial and advanced vocational education and training and lifelong learning. From our side, we shall continue with our work on skills and skills development throughout the, this year. In fact, we are organizing a major conference on the 10th of March on skills and talents as key drivers for personal fulfillment, economic growth and competitiveness. And this event will be looking at the current situation in the EU in relation to skills development with a focus on work-based learning and apprenticeships. There will be two workshops. One of them will discuss the advantages of dual education and in-work training compared to academic training and how these are preparing the future workforce. The other will look at the EU talent pool and discuss how the EU can become a more attractive destination for talented professionals looking for job opportunities worldwide. So a little bit of uh, ad and publicity for our own event. <laughs> We are also currently working on an exploratory opinion at the request of the Swedish Presidency on competence and skill development in a context of the green and digital transition, which will be exploring the skills that will be needed in view of the accelerating digital transformation, automation and transition to climate neutrality. Dear Madame Bane Barco, dear Director Scarpetta, thank you all for joining us today. We hope that we'll have the pleasure of welcoming you very soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.